Hello, Year 3s. So this is going to be the last part of our class novel for this week. Remember, it's the train to impossible places. So we're going to read the first half of Chapter 9 today. because It's another long chapter, so we'll just read half for today. The chapter is called Sun, Sea and Explosive Bananas. I wonder what that could be about. Sunlight burst into the cab like an explosion as the impossible postal express rocketed out of the tunnel and into fresh, salt-scented air. The chill of the darkness was swept away and a deep heat replaced it. Blinking away the glare, Susie hurried to the window. The eerie starlit desert had been replaced by water. Gentle turquoise waves peaked and troughed all around them broken here and there by tiny islands of sugar-white sand. Gulls sailed across them, gliding on the warm breeze, their wings hardly twitching. Wow, said Susie, turning to Stonker and Ursula in amazement. It's beautiful. The topaz narrows, said Stonker, adjusting a few instruments. A hundred leagues of the richest ocean this side of Lansdowne Harbour. Not bad for fishing when a chap's got the time. Susie pulled herself up onto the lip of the window and looked down. But that's impossible, she stared. Then she realised it didn't really matter whether it was impossible or not. It was happening. Without waiting for permission from Stonker, she rushed to the door and rushed out onto the gangway. Keeping tight hold of the handrail, she leaned as far out as she dared and looked down. There was no land beneath the train. Instead, the rails stretched across the surface of the water, apparently unsupported. The waves slopped over them and withdrew, and the train threw up an arc of spray whenever it cut through one. Tiny droplets were already settling on her face and the fabric of her dressing gown. Susie stuck out her tongue and tasted the salt and laughed for the sheer joy of it. I say there, Stonker appeared in the open doorway. You're letting in a draught, young lady. Sorry, she called. I just didn't want to miss this. The troll's moustache twitched in a reluctant smile. I suppose I can't blame you. First time out and all that. You can't beat the view from the bell. Susie frowned. From the what? Why, this old girl, of course, said Stonker giving the locomotive's flank an affectionate pat. Susie hadn't noticed it before, but his hand rested against a bronze nameplate fixed to the boiler. It read, Bal de Roi. A train can't go anywhere without a locomotive to pull it, said Stonker, beaming. And the express wouldn't get much mail delivered without the bell to take her places. He joined her at the railing and looked out across the water. It's a different sky, she said, squinting into the sun. A different world, a different everything. Her mind was itching with questions and she turned to Stonker, looking for answers. We were only in the tunnel for a few minutes. How did it get us so far? Because the impossible places aren't all lined up neatly together, except at the meridian, he said. Most of them are scattered all over the place. Threaded all throughout reality, she remembered. What's the meridian? A long story, he said, waving the question away. Now, because they're so spread out, there's a lot of empty space between them. Not the sort with stars and planets in it, but negative space where nothing really exists. It's just void, cold, dark and endless. People used to cross it in ships in the old days, but it's a dangerous journey and it takes an age. That's why some clever people once put their heads together and invented the tunnels. You mean they're wormholes, she said, linking one part of space to another? There's shortcuts between the impossible places, if that's what you mean, he said. They skip most of the negative space and a lot of them intersect with one another so they can connect to lots of different places at the same time. It's why most people get about by rail nowadays. He pointed out across the water, and she saw the glimmer of several other tracks winding between the distant islands. But this is fantastic, she said, as the lightning flash of understanding hit her. It means everything about Einstein's theory of relativity is true. Space isn't flat, it's curved, and you can cut straight through it from one bit of the curve to another. That's... wow! The enormity of it left her speechless. It's not really curved so much as lumpy, said Stonker, but I take your point. He drew himself up short and put his pushed his chest out. We're not here for the view. If you're going to be a member of this crew, you'd better get back to the HEC pretty sharpish. What's the HEC? That rusty old bucket between the sorting car and the bell. The postmaster needs you safely inside it before we can make our delivery. So come along, chop chop. How do I get back there? Over the tender, he said, ushering her back to the cab with a sweep of his arm. What? You can't be serious. Fear not. It's hard to slip on the bananas. Just be sure not to eat any. Ursula had opened the back door of the cab, giving Susie a clear view of the tender behind them. A series of shallow handholds were set into the side, leading up on top. Why shouldn't I eat any bananas, she asked. Because you'll explode, said Stonker, giving her a pat on the back. Now up you go. Susie took a moment to dry her hands on her dressing gown before nervously trying her weight on the first few handholds. She had trouble squeezing her slippers into the spaces, but was otherwise able to pull herself up quite easily. After just a few seconds, she had reached the lip of the tender. Sure enough, a hill of bananas rose in front of her. She had been expecting coal. Where do I go from here? 
Straight over the top, said Stonker. There's another ladder on the other side. Climb down that and cross the footplate to the HEC. You'll see a door ahead of you. You can't miss it. Right, Susie said, taking a few steady breaths. Wish me luck. I don't believe in the stuff, said Stonker. But I will say try not to fall off. Thanks, Susie said, I think. With one final breath, she hauled herself up and over. Walking on whole bunches of bananas was a strange sensation, she soon learned. On the one hand, they really did provide good traction, as Stonker had promised. Their thick skins were easy to get purchase on, and her slippers, though wet, didn't slip at all. On the other hand, the bunches kept shifting beneath her weight, and she was forced to walk her way across in an awkward half-crouch, helping herself up with the pile of the pile with her hands. To her alarm, the bananas fizzed as she made contact with her skin, and crackles of blue energy danced between them and her fingertips. It didn't hurt, but it did set her scalp tingling. Trains that run on bananas instead of coal, she said to herself. How does that work? That's easy, came a small voice from her pocket. They're fusion bananas. Susie looked down in surprise. She'd been so focused on the climb that she'd almost forgotten about the snow globe. What a fusion banana, she said. They're a fuel source, said the frog. A bit old-fashioned, though. People don't use them much nowadays because they're so unstable. Susie froze as more energy crackled around her fingers. How unstable exactly? The frog seemed to mull this over for a few seconds. They really only start to get critical once the skins are opened. The spark subsided and Susie let out a breath. Stonker sent us up here, so it can't be too dangerous, right? Right, said the frog. But you know what troll health and safety rules are like. No, she said, I don't. That's because there aren't any, said the frog. Thank you so much, she said through gritted teeth. You know, you still haven't told me who you are. Do you really want me to explain now? Yes, I do, now. When after a few seconds the frog had not replied, she paused her climb and addressed the bulge in her pocket directly. I'm still waiting. All right, fine, I'm Frederick. Frederick who? Prince Frederick, he said with his exaggerated patience, of the Western Fenlands. Who do you think? She snatched the globe out of her pocket and stared at the frog in amazement. You're a prince. Obviously, he said. And just because I'm not old enough to be king yet does not mean you can talk to me like I'm some commoner. Susie laughed. I'm so terribly sorry, Your Majesty. It's your Royal Highness, actually, but it's a start. What's your name? Or should I just call you Posty? I'm Susie Smith, she said. From Earth. So why are you a frog? And what does Lady Crepuscular want with you? Do you really want to talk about it here, he said. Susie looked around at the pile of bananas and the sea streaking past. All right, she said grudgingly. But as soon as we get a chance, I want the whole story, OK? Fine, said Frederick, although he didn't sound happy about it. She slipped him back into her pocket and turned her attention to getting safely over the mound of bananas. When she was near the top, she sprang, wanting to get over quickly. But the wind hit her from behind, lifting her dressing gown and filling it like a sail. She tipped over in an uncontrolled somersault and rolled down the opposite side of the pile with a cry of surprise. Help! shouted Frederick. But there was nothing she could do. The world was a pinwheel of blue sky and yellow bananas spinning around her in a dizzying cycle until she landed on the backside with her hair in her face and her feet braced against the rear end of the tender. Are you all right? she gasped. I think so, said Frederick. I still can't see through all this glitter. Susie pulled her hair out of her eyes. The bananas were behind her. A strange metal tube of the HEC was in front of her, and as she watched, a connecting door in its front opened and Wilmot popped his head out. Right on time, he said. Come on in. And that's all I'm going to read to you today. You have to wait for the second half of the chapter until next week.